He's Corey Brock, who covers the team for uh, MLB.com and has been for years and has joined us on the show in the past. And first off, uh, Corey, uh, I know it's a, a rare day off for you and the team, so thanks for taking a few minutes and joining us on the show today. Yeah, you bet, Steve, any time. I, I enjoy coming on. Well, we enjoy uh, talking baseball and, and always when you can slip in some beer recommendations at the very end. You and you and Jaffe, I, I probably trust more than anybody else in sports. You know, Jason Collette's not that far behind, but for the most part, you and Jaffe are kind of like uh, 1A, 1B when it comes to beer recommendations. Well, that's pretty good company. I feel pretty good about that. Oh, yeah, man. You're in, you're in great company. But I'll get that beer recommendation from you near the end of the show because um, Jaffe's been all over Ballast Point the last couple of weeks with some of their offerings. So I'll find out what uh, what you've been enjoying on the road recently. But in the meantime, hey, catch us up on, on everything in San Diego. You know, here we are in El Paso. we got the Chihuahuas coming home tomorrow night. Jamie Cork has been uh, relatively successful in his first uh, week and a half or so running the team uh, coming over from San Antonio. And meanwhile... You know, there's been a lot written, a lot said about Pat Murphy since he's arrived in, in San Diego. And uh, you know what? Through the first uh, couple weeks, uh, you know, how would you really review uh, the Padres with Murph compared to what you saw with the Padres and Buddy Black? Yeah, I guess if you were handing out grades, Steve, you'd give it an incomplete only because uh, you know the sample size is still very, very small and um, you know, I, I wrote a profile about Pat today on MLB.com, Padres.com, that kind of details some of the challenges that uh, Pat is facing and will face moving forward. You know, this is a tough spot. You know, they, uh, well, they say, you know, careful what you wish for in terms of, uh, you know, I'm sure Pat has always wanted to become a big league manager, maybe not under these circumstances, certainly uh, with Buddy, Buddy Black uh, losing his job. But uh, you talk about a, a guy with a lot on his plate. And, you know, the, the funny thing is, you know, the, the in-game stuff, that all kind of takes care of itself. He has a very good staff helping him out, helping him make decisions, um, giving him information. But it's, it's truly about learning those 25 guys in the clubhouse and getting them to learn about you and uh, building a, uh, a bridge of trust, essentially. And, you know, that takes time. And uh, that's why I think these interim man- managerial gigs – are are really tough and, uh, you know, maybe not super fair for a guy, but, you know, again, he's not going to turn this down. So I think it's a feeling out process right now, Steve. Uh, They're kind of getting getting to know each other, um, seeing what Pat's all about, Pat's seeing what they're all about. And, um, you know, I think he'll become more comfortable, as he said, uh, the further we move along in this process. But, uh, you know, you know, the early returns are, you know, have been pretty good. You know, I know guys love playing for him. uh, And there's a few guys on this roster, Brett Wallace, a few other guys that that have played for him in the past, and they rave about him. So um, I might I might be able to answer this question probably maybe a little shortly uh, shorter than I did this one uh, by the end of the year. But uh, again, yeah, kind of a work in progress, but. Uh, I think he's getting more comfortable every day. Well, I would definitely agree. Uh, and the funny thing is this. So in El Paso, the last year and a half, we've had the opportunity to just to get to know what he's all about from his personality and the way he's dealt with us and the media and the fans and the and, and the community overall. But when you're dealing with a club like he has in San Diego, that's such a mixed bag. So many veterans that are, are used to baseball guys. And, and not to say Murph's not, but his personality is just so different than Buddy Black. A, a lot of us were, were, were kind of wondering, you know, since the players here had that type of mentality that they'd give anything for a guy like Murph and, and you know, they just they love his demeanor, does that necessarily work when you're dealing with guys like Matt Kemp, guys like Justin Upton, pros that have been around the game so long but really have never seen that kind of personality in the clubhouse before? Yeah, I think that's a tough one to answer. We just haven't seen too many of these guys, Steve, that have, uh, you know, the – the extensive college resume, like Pat does, eventually uh, ascend to these big league managerial jobs. I guess I thought there would have been more, but mm-hmm. you know, I think these, these coaches at some point kind of face a fork in the road where um, you head down one path, and there's certainly Pat headed down the, the, the collegiate path early on. Um, a small school ended up at Notre Dame, and then certainly Arizona State, and and has now gotten into the pro game. So it's a little different path than a lot of these guys take. And you, you just don't quite know how that's going to, how that's going to play in a big league clubhouse. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, Pat is a, and I hate, I want to re- refer to him as a raw, raw guy. I mean, I think all these coaches are to some extent. Um, he's not a, you know, beat on his chest, do as I do kind of guy, but you know, he's very upbeat. Um, he is, uh, he's outgoing. Um, 
he's not afraid to let guys know what he's what he's thinking. Um, he seeks out opinions, and I think that's very important. Uh, he's, he's asked questions of me. I know he's asked questions of others, and not just in the front office or in the clubhouse. So very inquisitive. Uh, that's how he's trying to learn as he goes through this process. But yeah, you don't know what these guys, Steve, these uh, these tenured guys that have been in the big leagues, and certainly the complexity of uh, the composition of this clubhouse is a lot different now than it's been in years past, where you have some veterans, Matt Kemp, Justin Upton, James Shields. These guys have been through it. You know, yeah. these these guys have. Uh, playoff experience. Uh, they've been in the league uh, five plus years or even longer. So, uh, you know, I think they're really curious too uh, what this guy is all about. And, um, you know, I, and I think Matt Kemp had a a good point yesterday. It was short and succinct. Someone asked him, you know, what's it been like playing for Murph? And they said, he said, well, it's been about one week, but it's been great so far. <laughs> so, you know, I think uh, these guys are just trying to figure it out, trying to see what he's all about and see how he handles the job. So, uh, yeah, kind of a work in progress for everybody. Corey Brock covers the team for Padres.com and MLB.com and joins us right now here on Sports Talk. Padres home with Seattle beginning tomorrow. Um, I, I look at this team right now, they're four games under five hundred, and yet they're only six and a half back of the Dodgers for first place. So, Corey, they're, they're really like one good hot streak away from being right back into it. So I, I know it's almost impossible to think about you know the players in Murph right now because it's only been a few weeks, but... What do you do if you're A.J. Preller? You've got so much invested in, in guys with, with big contracts, uh, you know, players that, that could easily be franchise players on, on other clubs. Um, and, and I guess the question is, because Buster only brought this up, uh, I think about a week ago or so on ESPN.com, was, you know, do you stay all in as long as possible? Do you consider selling off if, if things don't improve closer to the deadline? I mean, that those are some really tough decisions when you think about what Preller will end up doing between now and the end of next month. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting when you look at the two sides of this. and You know, I think this, this upcoming schedule that leads up to the All-Star break is going to be uh, pretty telling for the Padres in terms of maybe uh, what direction they go. Um, you know, they have these two games with the Mariners and then head out on the road. You have four against the Cardinals, very good team, one of the best teams. Uh, three against the Pirates, very good as well. And then you wrap up with three against the Rangers, who are very hot. So, you know, I think they're going to have a good idea. Uh, not so much what they are. I think they understand that now. Um, you know, a team that's kind of prone to these uh, wildly inconsistent moments where they look like world beaters one day and then um, – you know, then they, they get shut out the next, for example. You know, just wild swings of inconsistency. But I, I truly think by the time that game in Texas ends on July 12th, they'll sort of have an idea of what they need to do leading up to that trade deadline. And, but, you know, here's the part of the problem. Um, you know, you invested so much in this rebuild, this revamped offense, adding James Shields. Um, it just doesn't send a very good message to your fan base uh, if you're going to tear it all down you know, six months after the fact. So, and you have to remember, you know, this is a franchise with, you know, kind of a tepid fan base, fans who have felt burned in the past about the team selling off uh, star players who have gone on to do very well elsewhere. Um, they have an all-star game, Steve, next year that they're hosting here mm-hmm. in San Diego. I think, you know, they're trying to build something um, in terms of not just successful team on the field, but, um, sort of uh, capture the the fan base here, and they did a good job of that in the off season without even playing a game. So I, you know, I, I just don't know. It sounds wonderful to say, time to hit the reset button. Uh, let's move these pieces. Let's recoup some prospects. Take a step back. To take a step forward. But the reality is, uh, I, I just think you lose a chunk of your fan base if you do that. I would agree with that. And yet, I look at right now this team, okay? And we've got Justin Upton, uh, you know, having a great season. 14 home runs, 45 RBIs hitting 270. Derek Norris has, you know, the batting average has tailed off, but he's delivered some power with 11 home runs. And, and yet... Will Middlebrooks has nine, and then you start looking at AAA, and you start seeing some guys that, that have a lot of power. And I wonder, you know, they have so much invest in this big league club, but since they're lacking guys with big power, could you start to see potential call-ups and, and see some more guys get their opportunity to uh, to go up to the big club and, and help out? You know, you can say what you want about Cody Decker. 
Cody Decker hits home runs and drives in runs and is having a great run, a great season these last couple, this, you know, these last few months. He's been on fire. So does it get to the point where you start to look at what you have here in El Paso to at least bring up the offensive firepower for this team? Yes and no. I mean, I think your point's valid. And, uh, you know, in knowing Cody like I do, just from being around him in spring training and such, I'd love to see him get a, get a shot and get a uh, – a stretch of at bats where uh, let's just see what he could do up here. You know what I mean? And I, I think that would be great. I don't know if that's going to happen. I think a lot of it's going to be dictated by uh, what happens with the, with the big league team in terms of, okay, let's say Steve, that we, we take that path a, and they end up moving some players, take a step back to take a step forward. Maybe you could see some guys from triple a, but I just don't, you know, I don't know where you, where you bring guys up now at this point. Um, you know, part of the problem is, you know, your outfield is pretty static now with uh, you have uh, Justin Upton in left, Matt Kemp in right, you know, in center field, Will Venable's been getting a lot of time. Oh, uh, Will Myers will be coming off the DL, I assume, sometime in August. Uh, around the infield, maybe that's a spot where we could where we could see some upgrades. Uh, I would suspect that uh, with injuries to Corey Spangenberg and Will Middlebrooks that we may see Jed Jerko tomorrow. Um, so he, maybe he's going to get another shot, um, you know, and get some playing time and get some at bats and apply some of the things he was doing in AAA, hopefully the big league level. So yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, it truly depends on, um, sort of what direction this team goes. And I, I just, I hate, like I said, I, it's just hard for me to fathom them, um, doing anything even akin to throwing in the white towel, which is, I think is what a, um, selling off pieces would be at this point. Well, I, I would agree with that. Now, it's funny you said Jerko. He's been uh, really uh, tremendous since he's come down here, and I know for a fact that he's been working a, a lot with both uh, you know, Jamie Cork and Jody Davis, especially on his hitting, and you can tell that he looks like a different guy. And I've always thought with somebody like Jerko, just a little confidence can go a long way, and you send somebody down to AAA. And I saw you write about this a few weeks ago, Corey, that you give a guy an opportunity to get here, get some regular at-bats, turn their confidence you know, their, their, um, confidence around and all of a sudden they go back up to the big leagues and hit the ball well yeah there's something to be said for that i mean sometimes it, it is confident sometimes it's mechanical uh, maybe with jet jerko it's, it's a little bit of both but you know and someone has explained to me before the uh, you know the chasm now between triple a and the big leagues is probably never bigger than it's been uh in this day and age that we're in right now and um, you know, you could send, and Murph had a pretty good example of this the other day, that you know, he said you could send a hitter down there to work on something, uh, let's say if a guy's having trouble with sliders low and away. Well, okay, so you send him down to AAA, and he, he may just be killing the ball down there, but he, he may not be killing sliders down and away because he may not be getting any because, you know, the pitching's so diluted. So um, it, it kind of maybe it gives you a little false hope, and these guys come up here and maybe they struggle. So... It's also individual, but you know, if uh, if Jed has found something down there that's working for him, that he could pl- can apply uh, up here in the big leagues against the best pitching in the world, um, you know, they they still want to see Jed Jericho. They you know they they're on the hook for some decent money for him, but you know they want to get him going. This is a guy they drafted and developed and and like a lot, and uh, you know I think they still feel like he's a big part of their future. But at some point, you have to produce up here. Corey, regarding their pitching, it seems like you've had good, you know, good pitching from Ross all season long. He's been relatively solid and consistent, game in, game out. But I'm a little surprised to see Shields and Kashner struggle. I know Shields is seven and two, but his ERA is over four, and, and Kashner's, you know, been hit hard at times this year. And, and that's a little unexpected for guys that I know were probably brought in to be a great one-two punch and really lead this team. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, we t- we spent so much time talking about the rebuild offense, and which is very notable, especially with a lot of the names that got brought in. But you know, other than adding Shields, they didn't do a whole lot to that pitching staff. I, I thought the Brandon Mauer trade was 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 a pretty smart one, and he looks he looks really really good. Um, you know, I think he's going to be a, a closer one day in the big leagues. But yeah, in terms of the starters, yeah, uh, wild inconsistency there. Uh, James Shields was hit very hard the last time out. He's been mostly. He's been pretty good and pretty steady and pretty durable, uh, kind of like what you would expect from a James Shields type of year. Uh, Kashner, yeah, you're right. He got he was really snake bitten early in the year. Uh, they committed a lot of errors behind him, didn't score him a lot of runs. But then in June, he struggled quite a bit. Last start was pretty good though. Ian Kennedy disabled list to start the year. 
um, in his first start, he was hurt. And so he's kind of been battling out of a hole as well. But, you know, I think he feels like he's, his best days are still ahead of him. So, you know, the, the thing is, Steve, with the pitching, um, yeah, they, these guys have struggled at times. They've had success at times. But I think they feel like th- these are at least the right guys. Yeah. That these are the guys that are going to make this happen inevitably. Uh, Brandon Morrow uh, probably come off a disabled list sometime here in early July. Probably take the Spagne spot. But so they feel like they have the right guys. They just need the right guys to put together the right performances.